Hi there, welcome back. Welcome to the third video in the series of the restoration of the SPI uh, power amp and preamp. In the last video, I completed the restoration of the uh, power amp stage, the power amp module, and we found that uh, most of the resistors needed swapping out. They were all out of spec, or most of them, with the exception of two. The uh, electrolytics were all swapped out as well. And we finally got um, the current draw and the voltages to where we expected them. Well, to a degree. The reason is that one of these channels supplies voltage or supplies power to the preamp. Now that might be a bit confusing. Usually, each channel would supply power to the respective preamplifier stage. In this case, it's not done that way. The supply voltage goes in, each one is a separate supply to the power tube, and then it follows on and supplies the double triode over here, the 12AX7, and then one side goes on and supplies voltage, or B+, to both channels of the preamp. Now that creates a bit of a problem, and I did some measurements and I will show you, but first of all, when I opened up the preamp and did some checking here, I found that all resistors were out of spec, badly. I've already replaced four of them, one, two, three, four. These are the uh, anode or plate resistors of the two 12AX7s that are in here. They were completely out. Um, they'd also, it seems, been swapped out already. I'm not sure, but there were two types of resistors here, so I presume somebody did some changes on here. It looks like I'm going to have to do the same thing here that I did over there. Fortunately, this is on a tag board and it's very easy to get to and it's very easy to do a nice clean job, which you can then just clean up with isopropyl alcohol at the end. So um, again, I'm going to try to keep this as original as possible. I am not sure about being able to restuff these like I did on that one over there, because the one over there was a one microfarad. These, I believe, are 50 microfarads, and I don't think they'll fit in here, but we'll see what we can do. So let me show you why this thing is out of balance as far as design's concerned for the power supply. What we actually have in the supply is something like this. We've got what they call B plus here of 265 volts. Then that goes to the power tubes and so on, and it meets a 56k resistor. This one goes to another 56k resistor for the other channel. So we've got a common B plus here and it is supplying the tubes, okay, it goes to both channels and then there is a derivation of here from from the B plus 56k resistor and at this point we have another capacitor. Now it's another electrolytic And that creates another B+. Plus. I call that B2+. Plus. Now that one, according to the schematic, is supposed to be 180 volts. Now this guy feeds the triodes of the 12AX7 that exists in that stage of the power amp. What happens then is that one side, this side say, meets another 22K resistor. And then there's two capacitors here, but I'm going to draw one. This is uh, two 16 microfarad capacitors. And then that goes off to the preamp, supposedly at 160 volts. Now, if that thing's going off at 160 volts, something doesn't make sense here. And it's uh, pretty obvious now when you look at what's happening to the currents. You have a certain amount of current, current flowing from there to there, 265 to 180 volts you've got 75 volt drop because of the current that flows through this resistor, okay? So the current, I, equals delta V over R, equals, what is that, 75 over 56K, and it comes to about 1.5 milliamps. Now, if you had 1.5 milliamps coming through there, you would have 180 volts. The problem is you don't have 1.5 coming through there. 
what you do have is 1.5 milliamps coming through there plus the current that's also going through there. So you've got two currents coming here. You've got this current as well. And what should this current be? Well, this current is 20 volts. In other words, 180 minus 160, if it's supposed to work this way, 20 volts divided by 22K, which is uh, near as damn it, what, 1 milliamp. Let's call it 1 milliamp. It's not quite that, but 1 milliamp. Now, if you've got 1 milliamp coming through here, and you've got 1.5 milliamps supposedly being drawn by this part of the circuit, you now have 2.5 milliamps coming through there. If you've got 2.5 milliamps coming through there, this is no longer 180. 180 volts, that there is wrong. Because you've got 265, you've got uh, 2.5 milliamps over 56K, which comes to about, uh, what is it, 160 volts? Something like that? So what should you have here? You're going to have something a hell of a lot lower than that. This whole thing is imbalanced because that node is not supplying the same current as that node. So these voltages, this voltage here, will always be less than that voltage there. And that is a bit of a problem, because I think this thing was designed like this, and what will happen is that one channel, the one, um, the, the preamp channel is seeing 160, or whatever it's seeing, both sides, left and right, are seeing 160 volts, or whatever it does see, and the result, the resulting audio coming from those channels, the left and right signal coming to the power amp, will be balanced will be equivalent in terms of uh, of level. However, when it hits the, the power amp, you've got one side that's being driven, and this is only for the 12AX7 at the front. The power tubes are actually being driven by 265, so that's fine. So the one side, caught at the left channel, is getting a lower voltage than this side here. And that means that they are driven differently. And I'm just wondering what kind of effect that's going to have on the actual signal coming out of the power amp. But we'll see that later. For now, we've got quite a bit of uh, resistor swapping to do. Just so that we have the numbers for later reference, I um, powered up the amplifier. I put it on a minimum restriction on the dim bulb limiter because I didn't really want to try a flat out power up. And I recorded some of the voltages we have here, and I'm going to show you them so we can then compare to see what we get after the uh, swapping out of resistors and uh, capacitors on this guy, on the preamp. So here we go. This was uh, measured after about five minutes of warm-up. The red is the actual, the black is what the schematic calls for. And uh, what I want to see is uh, when we do the modifications on the preamp, what differences it makes. I'm not sure that we'll get many, but because this is an incredibly low low uh, power here, you're literally just uh, biasing two or supplying two tubes for triodes, and those things are biased to pass a very low current. At least the 12AX7s are. So we'll see. We'll see what happens when we get this thing to the end and um, see if it makes much difference. Let's carry on. And here we are, finally. All these components, with the exception of one, two, three capacitors on each side, that one, that one, and that one, have been swapped out. And this is the debris. So these caps were the cathode bypass caps, completely leaky, it's supposed to be 50 microfarads at 6 volts. These guys are Hunts capacitors, which um, if you know the reputation, you'll know that they leak like crazy, and this proved to be the case. I actually lifted one of those pins on each one and um, tested the leakage with the capacitance leak leakage tester that I built, and those were perfectly fine. That one was completely leaky. So I decided to swap them all out, and um, in the case of the electrolytics, I needed to put in a uh, 47 microfarad, 
at minimum 6 volts. Obviously, I'm not going for 6 volts. I put in there 47 microfarads at uh, 25 volts. I did not use axials, um, so I wrapped them in shrink, uh, heat shrink. And uh, it does give it a bit of a more original look, strangely enough. So, um, again... Part of the objective here is to keep it as original looking as possible without uh, going crazy and without sacrificing quality. In the case of stuffing some of those, I think I did go crazy, but I think they're well worth it. Now, I have switched this on. <laughs> Believe it or not, I have not passed a signal through it yet, but I did switch it on to see what voltages I got. And... Um, I expected a lot more change since I did all this. Now, all these needed to be changed. There's no question about that. However, there was nothing here that was causing the current to be too excessive. So the leakage that you had here was not in the uh, coupling capacitors, which are on the other side. Those are perfectly fine. The leakage here was in actually in the tone circuit. A lot of this is actually the tone circuit. Obviously, these resistors here, that one, that one, that, 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 and those capacitors, those are the uh, actually the bias circuit and the anode uh, resistors for the tubes. So those uh, values needed to be uh, corrected. But there was nothing here causing a great draw of current. There are no filter caps for the supply on this side of the, uh, of, on this module which is uh, quite interesting. So this is all done. I powered it up and the voltages I got were not very different to what I had originally. And here's the uh, illustration of that. I've shown the original values and now I've shown the new values and you can also see what the theoretical values are supposed to be there. So all that remains is to do the uh, actual audio test. And one thing I'm going to do before I do that is I'm going to clean the pots. These pots and switches are probably pretty dirty. So I'm going to do a cleanup and then I'll show you what the result is. Okay, don't panic. I've already panicked, so one of us is enough. What you see here is actually my messing around with uh, some changes to try and get the voltages right. I powered this up and I noticed that that front panel, the one over there, which you can't see right now, was actually getting very, very hot. Now, the only thing that's connected to that is that uh, rectifier, the main selenium rectifier. So I figured that thing was dropping too much voltage and I was getting a lower than necessary voltage. I wasn't getting my 265. So I decided to reform or rebuild that rectifier. I've kept the same casing and put in four 1N4007 diodes and I dare you to try and find or try and show how this thing was opened. It actually opened very well. The diodes are in there and I powered it up and the voltage came up too nicely. It came up to 278 volts which was 13 volts above what I needed. The next thing to question was what sort of current the tubes were getting. So I put the ammeter between the output of the selenium rectifier or the new rectifier and the uh, filter caps. And I measured something like 294 milliamps, which is way too much. Now, bear in mind that coming out of that uh, B plus You've got the two power tubes being fed, and you've also got the rest of the circuit. But the rest of the circuit is actually receiving very little current. 1.73 milliamps to the one leg and about 1.1 or 1.07 to the other one. So most of that current, 260, 294 milliamps, about 290 milliamps was going through the two tubes, which is way too much. The biasing that they have at 265 volts, if you look at any data sheet, it's the classic EL34 class A, 
And what it says is that uh, you give it 265 volts and you should get 100 milliamps. I've worked out from their figures that uh, we're actually getting 93 milliamps per tube. So we have a bit of a problem here. And the problem is the voltage there coming out of the selenium rectifier to the filter caps is too high. So I decided to put a resistor in line and see what kind of resistor I needed to get it down to 265. I found that uh, 56 ohm brings it down to about 262. So 50 ohm is perfect, which I don't have, and I need to get one that's got a heat sink. So that's something I need to get tomorrow, and I think I can get it locally for a change. So that was the first step, and um, it brought it down quite nicely, but not enough. So the next step was to try and get the bias voltage. You remember that uh, minus 13.6? The way to get that higher, more negative, is actually to bring that uh, negative rail of that small rectifier we have there, the other selenium rectifier, closer to ground. And what we have here is 220 ohms to ground on the negative side. So if I reduce that, and I did that by putting a resistor in parallel, another 220 ohms, I get it closer and I get my bias voltage bigger, which uh, cuts off the power tubes a little bit more. Then I thought, wait a minute, if I'm changing the other selenium rectifier, I might as well change that one, but I wanted to test it in place first, so I put that in there, and that I'll have to f uh, finalize tomorrow, because I don't really trust selenium rectifiers, and since I'm doing these changes, I might as well do them properly. The selenium rectifier is out, and I'm going to have to rebuild it so that uh, the new part hides underneath it. Again, I'll do that tomorrow. And what I have now is I've got about 14.6, I think it was, or 14.3 volts bias. And I've got a 193 milliamps going through there, which means 190 to the two tubes, which means something like uh, 95 each, which is perfect. So this mess is actually on the road to somewhere. And again, the two brothers came into play at the same time. Brilliant. So hopefully when I get uh, these two components, I can get the voltage down. And the other thing I then want to do is complete the installation of that selenium rectifier. And then I will see whether I still need this parallel resistor. In other words, whether that uh, bias voltage comes down or not. So this mess is actually following some logic. Huh. Just cleaning up this mess is a pain in the butt, but you've got to do it. I'll be back soon.